instead of dark energy within the known universe, is there a chance something beyond is sucking to cause the expansion of the universe from beyond? In order for that to happen, there are two assumptions you can make. Assumption number one is, if that were the case, then that means that our observable universe is just a little bubble in a much larger universe. And something around the outside can therefore create that kind of expansion through suction. The other situation might be that if we, as a four-dimensional space-time, were embedded in a five-dimensional membrane, you could imagine that our four-dimensional thing is expanding in the fifth-dimensional thing almost because of something, say, a surface tension. In the same way that, say, an oil slick expands across, right. across the, the pond, surface of the water. Right, surface of right. the water when and the water is And it just keeps expanding no matter what. That's right. Balara Sundrum and Lisa Randall, they came up with this idea some years ago, suggesting that if indeed our space-time were connected to other four-dimensional space-time via membranes, that might explain things like why gravity is so much weaker on same yeah. distance scales as the nuclear force. Because it can extend over long distances and because it does not have a negative that cancels out the positive, gravity in the universe on cosmic scales has no equal. And I always thought gravity was merely potential energy. Right. But surely that can't be the case in space because there's no up, no down. Right. Gravity is not potential energy, but gravity, you. if you have a particle that's in a gravitational field and that particle has mass, it contains gravitational potential energy, which can right. then be released if it falls through the system. In space, we don't worry about up or down, Gary, as you rightly say. We worry about whether it's in or out. Or out, right. If it's close to or away from some sort there of gravitational center. If you have a field and you have a particle in that field that interacts uh -oh. with the field, there's okay. a little bit of energy. When you move that particle in the field, it feels a force and some sort of energy gets released. Depending on where you are in the field, the amount of energy released varies. When you're talking about Hawking radiation in a black hole, there's actually a lot that still needs to be straightened out. Pretty much anything emits something along the lines of Hawking radiation. It's just that for black holes, uh, it's actually important because that amount of emission is the only stuff that's coming away from the event horizon. We don't know if it's quantum tunneling. We don't know if it's just some sort of basic thermodynamic effect that happens in all cases. So there's still mystery there. So you put your finger on a good question that yet needs to be answered. Quantum field theory is in fact trying to knit together quantum mechanics, special relativity, and classical field theory. We, as particles, interact with fields, such as a gravitational potential field of the Earth. If you think instead that we, as particles, are actually not static things, but are rather waves or fields, and we're not looking at it wrong so much as we're looking at it in an incomplete fashion. So people are using different approaches to try to get at the same answer, and it's totally okay if you're not able to address everything with your theory, as long as somebody else is addressing the other stuff with another theory, maybe we can bring them all together. It's not that there are fields and there are particles and never the twain may meet. It is the very interaction of fields and particles that is the universe. So one of those would not be more fundamental than the other when they need each other to manifest the universe as we have come to know and love. Now we might say something else. We might say, is there something more fundamental than both the field and the particle? And, and Charles, would string theorists jump into this at this point? They might claim yeah, they, that they a want to particle, claim that. if the claim is that a particle is just a manifestation in our space time of what we see of a more complex object, then the interactions of strings to some extent might either supplant or supersede interactions between fields or interactions between particles. Right. As if gravity is an effect of of mass warping space-time, where does the need for a graviton fit into the relativistic model? If gravity is indeed a field that generates force, then there must be a particle that transmits that force. Let's call it the graviton. But it doesn't fit well in the current standard model of physics. In fact, you don't need the graviton to do 
any of those things with quarks and fermions and boson gravitons remain a mystery and they're a placeholder for some more sophisticated physical theories that we don't have yet that will link quantum mechanics with general relativity. We have nonetheless detected gravitational waves. Yes. So that's a very and Nobel Prize all right. around for that. That's right. And, yeah. Numerous people do think that uh, the gravitational waves are essentially an indirect confirmation of the existence of gravitons. Yeah. But yeah. I don't know. Did I tell you what Brian Greene told me recently? I had lunch with him. Brian Greene up the street here at mm -hmm. Columbia University. He told me that there's emergent thinking that this vacuum energy of virtual particles that pop in and out of existence, and mm -hmm. these particles are matter and antimatter pairs, he was suggesting that when they are created and separated, they're quantum entangled. And while they are quantum entangled, the actual connection between them is a wormhole, oh. which is how you can have information move basically instantly. And what he said was that the very stitches of space-time might be this myriad network of wormholes created by virtual particles coming in and out of existence. It's like an is a fabric, and the wormholes is the material that weaves the fabric of space and time. That wow. freaked me out. If you move backwards from a giant ticking clock at the speed of light, mm. what does it do? Relativity allows you to think of time and space in different ways because they are relative to one another, they behave differently. You do not see that clock tick because you are moving away from it at the speed of light. And so the sound or the information from the tick never reaches you. It will still tick in its own stationary frame of reference, but you will never know that it ever happened. So in that sense, you could say the clock ticks, but it doesn't tick for you. But if there's another clock that you're headed towards, then you would see that clock go faster because you're catching up with every next that's right. tick, correct? That's right. Okay. Frame of reference, that's what makes the whole thing work. Nice, nice. All right, that's let's keep going. Cool. We don't fear AI the way everybody else is right now. You guys are gonna destroy us all. Right? I already so know the name of our robot overlord. In my most recent final exam, I had for my students the following question. Type the following question into an artificial intelligence language generator, and now tell me what the answer is wrong about. If we can't be better than some free app you can get on the internet, then what is your value to an organization or to a graduate or to program anything. or to a, 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 a company? Yeah. You should learn how to use them, see their weaknesses, and use your education and your thought processes to make you more valuable. And that's how we must move forward in all of education. If we teach people exactly the same it way we it should did be that all the in the time. 19th mm -hmm. century, you know, which unfortunately mm -hmm. a lot of times we do, especially with math and science. What are we giving them? What is the advantage that they're getting from their education? Wait, 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 Chuck, Gary, Gary, I think Charles Liu is the overlord. I'm going to say. <laughs> Other than the common ways we transmit messages like radio and light, could we be bombarded with measurable or tangible transmissions and just not know it? If the civilization wants to be noticed, their signal should look different from the background noise of the universe. Otherwise, how could they could expect us to pick it up? But if they wanted to talk about us without us knowing, mm. which would be the alien equivalent of pig Latin in front of children, they would encode their message. You need a key, and with that key, it would be able to decode complete noise into the signal that you put there. But the real issue, because the, there's an issue here, the real issue is how did they get the key in the first place? Yeah, I'm going to say the key is pig Latin. <laughs> Wouldn't it be funny if they just sent us a message in pig Latin? <laughs> Al ye, are ye, ooh ye. <laughs> or ubby dubby. Ubby dubby. Or ubby there's dubby. a great one. Does life exist outside of our solar system, outside of our Earth, that's based on DNA? Would we recognize them if we see them? Would they have developed the same way that we did? If it is based on the DNA, which we find in all life on yes. this planet, then that would mean most likely that we came from someplace else. Charles, isn't it true in Star Trek? Season oh. seven, Star Trek, the next generation, the Holy episode called The Chase. Damn. Yes. That's uh, crazy. John Luke Picard's old. old anthropology professor figures out that there's something really cool, and they find out indeed that the reason all the Klingons and all the Romulans and all the Vulcans and all the humans have two arms, two legs, and one head 
is because they share a well, common we'll share genetic a common ancestor. ancestor. Yep. Right. Yeah. Given that energy is neither created nor destroyed, does this mean that all of the fossil fuels that are in the ground as forms of stored energy have been around for eons already? Energy can be destroyed by turning it into matter. The concept of energy can neither be created or destroyed was modified after e equals mc squared, and it's the sum of energy and matter that cannot be created or destroyed. The fossil fuels are solar energy. All those life forms got their energy from the sun. If they were plant life, they got it directly. If they were animal life, they got it because they ate the plants that got the sunlight. So fossil fuels is solar power. Once we use it and it radiates out into space, it goes back into the universe. It's not still here on Earth. Releasing the solar energy that was stored in these microorganisms, which were turned into coal and oil and natural gas or whatever these fossil fuels are, also releases at the same time how it got bound down underneath the Earth, which in this case is carbon. And the carbon comes out in the form of carbon dioxide, and it is adding something new to our atmosphere, atmosphere that right. we haven't seen in hundreds of thousands of years. If you're thinking about the system as our Earth's atmosphere, right. our biosphere, the environment that humans live in, oh yes, we are injecting a lot, a of, lot energy. of energy. We are adding a huge amount, and it's not just a balance change, it's an actual increase. We are altering the climate by re-releasing this Pandora's box of energy, primarily because of the byproduct of it which is the burning of fossil fuels, which is where you get your CO2. What is the largest object in the universe? If I were to say that an object is defined as something that is being held together yeah, in I'd some recognizable that. way by some kind of force. I hmm. go with that. Then the largest objects are these superclusters of galaxies out in space. They contain huge amounts of matter. Our Milky Way, uh, you guys know, has about hundreds of billions of stars. But these superclusters contain thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of galaxies. And so you add all that together, and then there's all that cosmological dark matter in between them. And so you've got a huge chunk of material that all is bound together by gravity. If it's bound together, we think of that as a coherent object, the cluster as an object. 